You need an airport, you need a stadium, what do you do? I know when I need an airport, or maybe an interchange on a highway, my trouble is I just don't know who to call. So today on episode number 258 of CXO Talk, we are speaking with the person you call. I'm Michael Krigsman, I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk, and we are speaking today with Brian Swenson, who is the Chief Process Officer at HNTB, which is a very large civil engineering, professional engineering services firm. I want to thank Avanade for underwriting CXO Talk. You know, we don't charge people to be on the show. It's, this is, it's based on merit. We don't charge people to listen, and so we thank folks like Avanad for underwriting the show uh, because it makes it possible for us to be here. We're like NPR in that way. So without further ado, Brian Swenson, you are the Chief Process Officer at HNTB. Thank you so much for taking your time and being here. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be with you and your audience this afternoon. So Brian, uh, tell us about HNTB. You're a large company and you've been around for, for a long time. Yeah, actually, we've been around for 103 years. So um, there's not too many engineering firms in the U.S. that can say that. We're pretty proud of that. Uh, we're about a 4,000-person firm. We're based solely in the U.S. Uh, we do about a billion dollars of revenue every year and focus primarily on horizontal engineering. So you'll see us associated with airports, rail, um, transit, and, uh, and highways is the areas that we focus on for our customers. So literally, if, 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 a, if a government or a company needs to build a large structure like, like an airport or, or a stadium, you're the folks who they call. We certainly hope they're the folks who we call or who they call. Yeah, we, uh, we do a lot of work for public and um, public governments and, and private agencies. Now, Brian, you're the chief process officer. So what, is, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so in my role at HNTB as the Chief Process Officer, I'm, I'm responsible to uh, make sure we have documentation, um, consistency in the processes that our firm operates on as we pursue, contract, and deliver work for our customers, um, work with the business units to adjust and modify those to create better efficiency and consistency. Right now, my primary focus in this role is to lead the development and the transformation of our sales and project management solutions into a new platform. It's a multi-year effort for us, and I'm, um, I'm the individual at HNTB responsible and accountable to make sure that happens. I want to remind everybody that there is a tweet chat happening right now using the hashtag CXO Talk. So it's a great time to ask questions of Brian and to participate in this conversation. So Brian, the firm is over a hundred years old, and obviously, to have been in business for so long, you've gone through many evolutions. What are the, the, the industry pressures or trends or technologies that are shaping the company today? Yeah, it's a great question, Michael. Uh, what we see, and this is specifically for h and but I'd also say in the industry as well, that projects are getting larger. Um, agencies are looking to... Um, get the most out of their money, bundle packages and projects together uh, in, in larger areas. So they're single points of, of responsibility with their engineering firms. And we're certainly seeing that at HNTB. And that's changing the way we pursue our projects. It's changing the way we manage and deliver our projects. So that, that change in project size is a, is a significant factor for HNTB. We're also seeing a change in our workforce as we have more millennials and, and Gen Wires uh, working at h and they have a different expectation around the technology and the tools that we as a company uh, utilize and, and work with our employees on. And then lastly, Michael, is, is really our, our, our systems that we use. Many of our, our systems uh, to, to run the company, to manage the company are, are quite old, um, uh, built on code that's out of date and, and we struggle, they're not interconnected. So we have a hard time getting data, having single sources of truth for data and evaluating uh, what's right uh, with that data. So 
you know, those three areas, projects, um, end user employee expectations around technology and the quality of our data really drive um, h and tv's journey here it's pretty interesting so it's a so it's a combination of uh say employee and cultural expectations along with changes in the technology environment that's that's exactly what it is you know t- today with with the way technology changes so quickly on our, on our on our phones, you know, uh, there, there's an update every every couple months it seems, and it just pushes through. Um, our, our our employees just are they, they've come to expect that they've come to demand that, and honestly, we've had employees um, uh, question H and T B on 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 the um, the modernness, so to speak, of our technology, and and I've had a, a number of conversations with individuals that are are very surprised at where H and TV's technology is at today. Um, now we're changing that, and we're moving it into a more modern uh, situation and scenario. But it it's really become more of a focal point, and especially in this war for talent that's going on in the engineering industry right now, it is something that employees are looking at, and what sort of technology. Uh, and sophistication and modernization of solutions that firms have, um, it does play into their decisions on where they want to work. That's that's interesting. So you have uh, a, a war for technology as you a war for talent. Yes, it's 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 very tight right now. Certainly, um, as as the U.S. is moving forward with funding, we've seen significant funding increases um, through the last federal reauthorization bill. Last year's elections brought hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in new money, uh, primarily on the West Coast with self-help funding. And then with the president's infrastructure program, uh, more money is going to be coming into the marketplace. So uh, we clearly see a war on talent within the engineering spaces. And this is one of the areas HNTB is looking at to make a difference to help uh, elevate the firm's capability to respond and deliver programs and projects for our clients, but then also to attract and, and retain uh, our employee population that we have here at h and And so what's the relationship between technology and the type of technology that you purchase and deploy? What's the relation between that and being able to attract the talent and attract millennials, as you were just describing? Yeah. So, you know, our, our, um, our legacy systems are, are, are just, they're just old. They're they're, they're 20 years old. Uh, they're, they're not. Um, they're, they're not connected. It, it's hard to get information. We spend a lot of time manipulating data within our systems because they they don't talk. Um, they're they're not they're not modern. They're not easy to update. They're not they're not easy to adjust. And you know, one of the things that that really uh, that I realized as I stepped into this role as the business lead for our our ERP initiative, and and I'm a I'm a civil engineer. By trade, I am not a technology individual, so this has been kind of eye-opening for me in the past four years in this journey I'm on. But making these changes to our existing systems, H and TB is not in the business of software development and and software enhancement. Um, and with these legacy systems, that's what we had gotten ourselves into, and and we had just really not invested in that because it, it's just not our strength. Well, now as we move to these modern systems. Um, and we're using uh, Microsoft Dynamics for our solution. You know, Microsoft is the one that does that investment in research and development, and then we can choose what pieces of the application we want to apply with this. So, it's it's that link, it's that connection of how can how can we keep our technology up to date? How can we keep it current? How can we keep it cutting edge? That's the value. That's the connection that we're trying to make uh, for our employees, and then to also drive um, the growth and and profitability of H and T B. So are you using uh, cloud solutions when you talk about Microsoft is now responsible for maintaining this? Is this cloud that you're referring to? Uh, we're, we're looking to move into the cloud. Right now, we're operating on-prem uh, with our solutions. We have some cloud solutions in, in other areas, but um, uh, we're, we're just going through that discussion and evaluation around cloud and certainly see the trend moving more and more towards that. Uh, we're evaluating our path to get there and how we make that happen right now. What about the issue of user experience? I would imagine that that's kind of very much interrelated into with with all of this. Absolutely, user experience is a key thing. You know, people have to feel it's easy. They have to feel it's efficient. We find in many of our reporting um, applications now, and again, our reporting applications were were even homegrown, and so they're twenty years old. Well, 
all they do are show numbers. There's no graphical capability to it at all. We have to export information out of our data systems, um, put it into to Excel and graphically display it or put it into Tableau, other, other solutions we have, but it's all that manual manipulation moving from one system to another. We're looking to implement an, an, an EIM reporting solution, modern and cutting edge, that we can take advantage of that all in a single system. But you're absolutely right. That, that user experience is key and it's what our employees are driving for and demanding as they look at new software and see us implement new software within, within the firm here. So, and, and what about um, mobile? Again, I'm assuming that that's a key part of what you're doing. You know, it sure is. Um, I'll go back to our legacy systems. That's, that's not available for them. We don't have that implemented. One of the advantages of going to a modern ERP enterprise platform here is that mobile comes with it. So uh, we, we have a, a legacy time card to track time for our employees on a weekly basis um, it wasn't that long ago, about a year or so ago, we, we, we made a really um, low-tech upgrade to it to be able to make it mobile, and we were amazed at the response and utilization, implying to us of the pent-up demand for access to mobile information. So that was our first step really going mobile, and now that we've got a, a, a CRM solution um, up and running where we have our uh, first step of our um, project management solution, we're looking now at, okay, what pieces would make sense for mobile? What, what capabilities do we need to put out there? And we'll do a stepwise. We'll probably, you know, um, crawl, walk, and run in that pace with it. But we're clearly seeing the need for mobile, the expectation for mobile, the demand for mobile in our solutions as we move forward here. So you, you, what I find really interesting as well is it seems that the type of technology that you are selecting now and implementing is very much intertwined with the culture of the company and the, the expectations that users have. Yeah, and I see it that way as too, Michael. You know, none of these solutions that we implement are in and of themselves going to make h and be more profitable or help us win more work. They're all enablers. So what can we leverage with technology to make ourselves more efficient? Or what can we leverage to share more information or what can we leverage to create a broader awareness and information sharing? That's a lot of what we see with the technology. And it's all enablers. I'll never be able to go back and say, because we implemented this piece of a project management solution, we were able to generate this much additional earnings. But we know tied together with other pieces, you know, from the, the, the human side and the system side, overall, we can we can elevate H and TB and see an ROI on this investment. And that's really what we're driving for and looking at with these solutions as we move forward here. So this technology then and the ROI that you seek is on the business side as opposed to merely seeing, say, project management results on the IT side. Project management results saying, okay, we were on time, under budget, that's important, but there are business metrics that you're, that you're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Michael. At h and we've, we've got a mantra. We call it four for four. It's quality work, on time, within budget, to the client satisfaction. We know when we deliver on each of those, we're going to have uh, satisfied and happy clients. And those are the easiest ones to win your next job with when the client is feel, feels you have their back covered and you've delivered for them. So we look at these solutions as all helping us, enabling us to meet those, those four metrics. Those are what we're really looking for. That's how h and measures success with our clients. It's not about, you know, how quick did that piece of software run or how, how soon did we get it up and running? It's how is it helping us deliver that four for four for our customers at the end of the day here. Which means, of course, that this then is a business-led technology transformation rather than an IT-led one. You have hit it right on the nose, Michael. And when I think about HNTB's uh, journey, our transformation journey here, that's a key differentiator than other um, stories I've read and, and, and implementations I've seen is it's, it's led by the business. This was a, a key, it was a critical decision, decision made early on by HNTB's leadership to set it up as, as a business-led initiative, business engagement, and, and I am convinced the success that we will have as we go forward with this and are having is a result of that. 
you know, many times these types of projects are led by IT. And so how do you, where does IT and then the, and the business intersect in this case? Yeah, yeah. So let, let me share. We started out this, this journey, and we've been on this journey for four years now. So we started out this journey that it was it really a joint effort between uh, my team, which, which is our business process office. So I was leading the what. What does the business need? What, what type of uh, requirements does the business have? And I had an IT partner who was leading the how. Well, how are we going to do it technically? How does it all come together? And, and we worked together for six months to maybe nine months on that. And then, then it became apparent that this joint effort just wasn't getting us to where we, we wanted to be. And, and in conversations that, that I had with, with leadership around the firm, we decided it was best that we have the business take over the overall responsibility, the overall accountability for leading this solution forward. And, and we adjusted and, and we've moved forward from there. What, what's important, I think, Michael, with that is, is an understanding that with the business leading it all, and this doesn't mean that the IT uh, organization is put off to the side or minimalized or just, well, they're out there, we'll worry about them when we need to. But the IT group is an integral partner with me and our program as we go forward. Our CIO and I work together closely, um, but I, I have overall accountability but I rely on, on my IT department uh, heavily. This, this program would not be where it is without that. And, and so there, there were, there were um, barriers we had to break down between IT and the business four years ago that existed due to years of issues and challenges that I, I, I'm very glad to say they, they're not there anymore. And it's, it runs like a well-oiled machine right now. It's, it's just very different than where we were four years ago, the relationships between the two groups. But you say uh, you have overall account, uh, overall accountability, even though clearly this is a techno. Well, I was going to say this is a technology project, but in fact, is this a technology project? It's an interesting question. I think it, it is. I mean, clearly, all of this happens because of technology. But the driver is the business side of this. If we don't get it right for the business, uh, the, the business doesn't see value out of it. What are we doing this for? How are we helping the business? So. It's clearly technology. That's the basis that we sit behind. That's how we're going to tie all of our solutions and systems together. But with the business driving it, with the business making decisions of what, how are we going to do this? Uh, how, how do we, what is it we want from the setup and the operational? That, at the end of the day, that's what will drive this, the success. It's not the technology behind it, but it's the decisions that make the technology function the way we want it to. That's what will determine our success at the end of the day here. And and that's, again, where I look at with, with the business making those decisions, owning those rescission, decisions, being responsible. That's the difference in a lot of what I've read and talked with people uh, and other companies that haven't had success to the degree that they wanted to. How do you make that work? You're, you, you are expert, large-scale professional project managers, but this goes beyond project management alone. This gets to the fundamental fabric of the connection between IT and the business inside your company. It sure does. And, you know, that's when, when H&TB first, uh, four years ago, picked, selected a team to, to lead this. Uh, and I was actually, I, I, I had heard about it through the grapevine that we were starting a program like this at H&TB. And what truly intrigued me about it was an opportunity to leave a legacy with the firm as, as far as the new project management and sales solution. I've got 30 plus years at h and working in our business, working with clients, understanding how we do business. I've got two other business partners with me, uh, business leaders. Um, they, one has, they both have 30 plus years in, in the industry and in the business here. So a very well-seasoned, very skilled, very knowledgeable group of people who have done project management, who have done office leadership, who have done general management. So they understand how all the different pieces and processes fit together. That's what's driven the success. It's, it's, it's that team that's come together. So the team understands what the business needs to operate. And the IT component, the IT partnership, is they understand how all of our systems operate and work together today. So we meld, again, what's needed with how we're going to do it. 
and, and we've got a vendor helping us with that as well. But but IT is is again, it's a critical partnership. We would not be where we were where we are today without the the focus and the commitment and the drive of our IT group to make this program successful. Brian, you mentioned uh, what it is we're trying to do combined with how do we do it. How, can you elaborate how these two, the what and the how, map onto the business side and the IT side and how they, how they come together? Yeah, when we um, when when we think about the the business processes and and you know we've been around for 103 years, so we've got some pretty sound business processes going forward here. But um, th- those form the basis. And as we started this program, we had some pretty strong guardrails in place around our business uh, ar- around the design on the business side that you know we weren't going to customize. Um, we wanted to minimize customization. We wanted to take the solution right out of the box uh, functionality. Where we would customize would be where it gave us truly a clear business advantage, a competitive advantage, and or we'd customize where there were contractual requirements that we had with our customers that the out-of-the-box system wouldn't work. Well, that that's where we, the business, have spent a lot of time with uh, working through those, figuring out what's right, and it's what's helped us get to the point so far around, again, the, the, the minimal customizations, trying to drive out of the box. We're, we're looking long-term with this, Michael, that this solution is going to be around for many years, and we know we're going to have upgrades with it, and a lot of what I've heard with this over the years is that upgrades get really difficult the more you customize. So, it drove us to really take a mantra to take a stand. We wanted to minimize eliminate customizations to a very high degree and 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 look to even adjust HNTB business processes. And we've got um, different examples where we've done that to change the way HNTB operates to take advantage of how the, the technology operates natively. Haven't done it in all cases, but we have had some successes in doing that. And this is the time we want to look at those. This is the opportunity to know how the business operates but if we're putting a new piece of technology in and we can set it up to do what we want, or we can adjust HNTB to operate the way the technology does, well, then we want to look at both those scenarios. And that's a lot of what my and my team's role is, is to make those decisions, make those evaluations, and, and, and make the best decisions on behalf of HNTB. So IT is bringing the knowledge of software, software implementation, and you're bringing the knowledge of the business processes, and then you're marrying those together. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Now, it's been a number of years since we've done a major ERP implementation, um, but we've got lots of skilled people on our our, uh, IT group and our IT team. So yeah, they, they implement software all the time. This is nothing new for them. Very, very, very new to me. But, you know, my, where, where I come to the table is I, I've got many years as a project manager. So, you know, I've got a great team set up around me and I rely on them. I reach out to them, give them the, the, the reins, so to speak, to, to, to bring to the table what they need to do. Let, let their areas of expertise come forward. I don't have the answers to many of the questions that come up on this, this project day in and day out. But I've got a team around me that has a lot of experience, a lot of insight that that we collaborate, we discuss, we dialogue, we debate in cases. And at the end of the day, I'm responsible to make the decisions around how we go forward and what we do. But I've surrounded myself with a very strong team from, from a business side, from an IT side, and from a vendor side. And it's those three legs that I, I lean on, that I leverage to help the program in total, move forward and make sound decisions about where we're going. I want to come back in a minute to the issue of, of the, the working relationship and how you cultivate trust across these, these three groups, the business, the external vendor, and IT. And in this case, I know the external vendor is Avanade, who, again, Correct. I'm so grateful to for underwriting this episode. But we have, in the meantime, an interesting question from Twitter. Arsalan Khan asks, how much business optimization has happened during those four years? Because four years is a long time for processes to be still and unchanged. Yeah, so uh, I, I would share, again, we're, we're 100 years old. 
So our process is they're not, they're not changing every day. We've, we've got pretty darn good at winning and delivering work. Um, we, so we've been in a four year, uh, a journey here at the end of, um, uh, two, two and a half years, we implemented CRM and that that's our customer relationship management solution. And, um, you know, that was to take a system that was 20 years old, a legacy system and, and, and bring it into to the modern world. So, I, we haven't we haven't done a lot as far as process change, but in access to information, um, uh, a, a common platform that we can share data across was one of the real benefits we got from that, and what we were driving for. We just recently, just as in June of this year, implemented our work planning solution uh, for the firm, and we've actually had you know more process change go into that, and it's it's optimization. I. We're, again, we're not rewriting the books of, of how we work at H and T B because it's it's a pretty pretty defined, well oiled. But there are adjustments that that we're making, and we're even considering adjustments now as we're moving forward into the next phase. So, um, again, I, I think my answer on this is our processes are are fairly stable. This this program, this journey wasn't meant to revolutionize our processes. That's not what we were looking for. We were looking for a way to bring. Actually, the big driver was. We wanted an enterprise-wide work planning solution. And, and by work planning, I mean scope, schedule, budget, and resources, all in a single system. h and is a professional services firm. We, we live and die by our work plans. And, and that's how we track our progress, how we staff our projects, how we manage our, our budgets and finances. Prior to this program, all of that was done externally in silos. And information wasn't shared and coordinated between them. So our real journey was not process transformation itself. It was to create a single enterprise location to drive and, and house our work planning activities. And, and that, that, that's what we've been going on to get to this point up to now. So when you say single enterprise location, you're talking about, in a sense, a virtual location because you have... You have people working all over the country on projects and offices and so forth. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a virtual location. Um, and the challenge that we've had prior to this is a lot of the, 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 the information, what, what, sat in our inter, what sat in our enterprise system was, was the budget. I said scope, schedule, budget, and resource. Well, budget sat in an enterprise system, but the scope was, was, was kind of loosely coordinated Scheduling, that was all in, in Microsoft projects or Excel files on individuals' computers, their desktops or laptops. And resourcing um, was all manually updated and, and challenged to keep up to date. And we do a lot of resource management by phone calls. Hey, I've got some work for someone here. I've got some work for someone there. Again, we're a 4,000-person um, corporation. That's not a very efficient way to manage our workload. And so part of what we want to get out of this, out of, out of the, uh, the ultimate journey here, is a way that we can have insight into how, how utilized or underutilized staff is in a given office, how we can share work among staff in given offices. And, and an enterprise solution like this um, gives us that, that visibility, visibility to see that um, at, at, as we go forward in the program here. And before you had all of these legacy systems, so the information was scattered in different places and was highly fractured and fragmented, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's exactly right. It was a very inefficient way to, to access the information. Again, I, I mentioned resourcing in many cases was done by phone calls. It's one office calling another. And hey, do you have some work? I've got some people that are slow. Can you help me out? And again, just not an, an efficient use, not a timely uh, way to evaluate what 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 is the availability or or the need in a given office of, of staff and resources. Now let's go back to this issue of IT and this being a business led project. How did you get IT? You know, in so many companies, IT and the business are kind of almost separate tracks. And so how did you develop the, the trust of, across these two groups to kind of break down those silos? Yeah. So one of the, uh, the focal points that HNTB use and one of the value points that we feel is strong about HNTB is, is, is we discover and we deliver. Um, we want to discover what clients value and then we deliver on that value piece. It was the same approach, Michael, with the IT group is... Um, 
the business, as we started this, this was four years ago, and, and we had some walls between, between the business and IT. My intent and my, my other business partner's intent was really to discover and learn how IT operates, how, um, you know, what are their issues? What are their concerns? What are their challenges? And we encouraged IT to discover with the business, ask us questions, seek to understand, seek to clarify. And I just think, you know, four years ago, the perspective was, well, IT is late again, or we've got another project that's over budget. And, and I don't know all the situations, but that was kind of the general perspective. It, it's not like that anymore. With, with the partnering and the open dialogue, um, IT has seen that the business is only successful when IT is successful and, and vice versa. IT is successful when the business. And how do we generate that success? Well, we work together. We collaborate. We're transparent, we're open, and and you know it just it took a while to get there, but it was it was that willingness to talk, it was the willingness to listen, it was the the asking questions, seeking to understand. That's really what broke down the barriers. And and I can remember when we first started this journey, boy, those first six months, it was it was like, well, business, why are you asking about the how? That's not your space. Don't worry about that. We got it. And well, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I, I'm trying to get my arms around what it is you have to do. And, and over time, uh, you know, that that's changed, but it, it, it took a little, it took getting used to it. It took me continuing to push and ask and drive. And, and I encourage that same thing from the, from my team. If you challenge me on the, what seek to understand the, what, so we're both learning and getting comfortable, not just one way here. And that has really been effective for us, Michael to to change the relationship and the trust between between the organizations and we're clearly on the right track with that moving forward. So you've so you have had to come up to speed on technology to to probably imagine a pretty high degree and the IT side has had to come up to speed on the the business issues and the business challenges to a pretty high degree as well. I would imagine yeah, very true. It seems like I'm learning a new IT acronym every other day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just learned one the other day, data integration. So, um, but yeah, there, there's been a lot of that going on and, um, and, 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 you know, we're very open to it. I, I, I'm, I can make better decisions. I can, I can provide better guidance and counsel if I understand where IT's at and what they're trying to do. And it's the same thing with them. If they understand the business objective, if they understand the what, I want to draw on their thinking and their thoughts around, well, we could do A, B, or C, knowing you want you want this, and then you want that. And here'd be the best way to consider that. And it's that open dialogue. It's that collaboration. And, and that's another aspect of, of just the culture around HNTB. Our approach is we collaborate for the benefit of everyone. And, and this, this, this whole mindset around we're going to be stronger if we collaborate rather than put up our silos and work separately. We're going to fail when we do that. And, and I would say we started the program and we had some silos. There are no more silos as we go forward now. They're, they're gone. And both the business and IT are, are, are extremely collaborative and focused on a common outcome. How do we deliver value to our business, to our line organization with this program? I love that uh, that that emphasis on collaboration, and you know this show is being underwritten by Avanad, and again, I'm so grateful for, to Avanad for doing so. And you're working very closely with Avanad, so share with us the type of collaboration that you have with with Avanad. Yeah, so Avanad has a team uh, working side by side with us in our Kansas City office. That's that's our home office. So we've got a team there. Uh, and then they also have a development team offshore in India. So we work with both groups, um, but it's it's a it's a weekly um, set of activities, collaboration, dialogue. Um, we treat Avanad as H and TB employees. Uh, they are a vendor, they are a consultant, but again, it's you know we're breaking down the barrier. It doesn't it doesn't it's not helping us to hold back or be afraid to offer a perspective or raise a flag of an issue. Just because they're the they're the vendor, they're the consultant. My 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 guidance, my expectation of my team is again, it's a three legged stool. It's the business, it's IT, and it's Avanade, and we all work together as one team. We check our our, our business units, our company names at the door, and we have one objective, we have one focus. It's to deliver this program 
as cost effectively and as with as much value as we can. And, and that drives all of the conversations between all the parties. So how do you do that? This is, this is a very complex project that's running across your entire company, changing your, your core systems. And so how do you work that kind of hand in glove. You said that you don't see Avanad as an, as an external party, really. You see them as as employees of the company. How do you make that work, that kind of relationship? Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, as a lot of companies do, I'll say we have weekly coordination meetings. We have them at different levels. We have kind of executive coordination meetings between myself and, and Avanad executives. We have project team meetings. So it's the Avanad program manager, um, one of my business leads and an IT lead, they operate. Then we have pro- uh, kind of project manager type meetings at a lower level. So there's a series of cascading meetings. So I'm, I'm going to call it a, a, a ladder type management approach, but different levels of, of the organization driving this program are talking and di- dialoguing all the time. Um, we, um, we, we also kind of cross pollinate those meetings, Michael. So there'll be times that I'll sit in on a triage meeting because I want to know what's going on. I want to see how the teams are operating. I want to make sure we don't have barriers. Um, it, it, times a, a year or so ago when, when pressure was on to get something delivered, we, we were finding we had some barriers between um, our vendor and, and H&TV staff. And, well, they're not getting it to us on time or we're sitting here waiting for it. And why aren't they working on the weekend with us? So, you know, again, it's not, it's never that situation, which is, okay, we, we're having coordination issues. It's, Let's figure out how we're going to respond to it. It's never the situation. It's how you respond. So, you know, we got both sides together. We're not, we're not going to throw names back and forth. Um, let's sit down. Let's figure it out. And let's make a plan going forward. And the more we do that, the more then the teams pick up on that themselves and they just self-regulate and they self-manage. And, you know, honestly, we haven't had problems like that in the last year, year and a half. And I, I do believe it's because the teams have just grown closer. They, they operate as one. And they don't think of themselves as a vendor and as h and staff. We're all working on this program and we're all basically one entity. You know, this kind of self-regulation, it doesn't always happen. So, so again, I really want to drill down into this, this concept of trust yet again, because how do you engender the trust on both sides that enables this type of close and very positive cooperation to to arise. Yeah. So I, I'd go back to Michael. I've got um, two business leads that work with me, both very senior skilled individuals. The IT leads um, are, are, are senior as well as Avanat. I've, you know, I, I, we've got a great team that we've, I've surrounded myself with. I, I've shared with them my expectations and we just continually push it down. Uh, my team and, and I are all on the same page is how we're going to operate together, how we're going to function, how we're going to treat each other. And I think that's the first critical piece because if, if, if my team underneath me is out of sync, well, then it's going to fall apart beneath them. So, you know, I, I hold a set of meetings and conversations with my teams. I lay out the expectations and then, you know, okay, so now you guys in your specific areas need to go out and do the same things. And, and at, it, it seems simple to me, maybe because I've done it so long, Michael, I just take it for granted that this is how we're operating and running, but it's how I've always managed my teams. It's how I've always managed projects. And I've, I've always had success with it. I haven't had uh, problems where it is. Well, then you have to engage. Um, and again, I'm going to like, there's another acronym HNTB uses. It's called EDA, engage, decide, and act. So if somebody's not on board with how we're doing something, it's not, well, I'm going to hope it gets better. But we're going to engage, we're going to decide what the action is, and then we're going to act on it. And if, if someone you know, needs to have a conversation with, we'll have a conversation with. If someone's not a right fit for the team, we'll make an adjustment to it uh, going forward. So um, it, it's just it's all about leadership in, in my mind with this and, and how you drive whatever style of leadership you have. And I'm going to assume it's an appropriate style. You drive it down through your team and you reinforce it with your team. You celebrate when things go right. And, you know, you give credit to your staff. When things go wrong, it, it's, it's me. I take the ownership for it. I'm not going to pass blame to others. I'm ultimately accountable here. And, again, it's that sense of team. It's that sense of com- camaraderie. It's a collaboration. Um, it's just it's what I have found to be effective for me. 
And, and I know it's a solid leadership style that works in a lots of lots of different scenarios. And this carries forth both on your team as well as on the external team, in this case, which is Avanade. Yes. Um, Avanade has a client and exec- an account executive that is in h and offices weekly uh, that I interact with regularly. They have their program manager. Uh, and then they've also got a, a, a project manager that works with. So I interact with, with Avanade's account exec and their program manager on a, on a weekly, many times daily basis. We're interacting. And, and what, what works, what we have found that works, and, and what I've talked with them about is I expect transparency. If, if you're not telling me something and we've got a problem, I can't help solve it. I can't react to it. And if it's going bad, it's not going to be good for you or us if we don't know about it and work on it beforehand. So this is something that we've talked about a lot. We've, we've done AARs, after action reviews in situations where we've struggled with it and we've changed our approach. But we're at a point that we're very comfortable and confident in cases sharing the dirty laundry. What's not working? What haven't we reacted to right? What's going on? Now, you know, it's taken a couple of years, two or three years to get there with it, but it's, it's where it needs to be. It's, it's, there's this open dialogue. And again, I go back to it's, it's not Avanade and HNTB. It's, it's and my program's called the centric program. It's the program that we're focused on. So, you know, let's put everything on the table. Let's be open. Let's be honest and let's deal with it. That's the only way we're going to see success as we go forward here. And Avanade has demonstrated they're willing to do that. And to me, that's, that's a, that's a key component of a, of a vendor and, and a critical piece in my mind of what is, what makes a successful relationship between a vendor and an, and an account or a customer. Makes perfect sense. I mean, you're, you're a large scale project manager. So when you, when you talk about these issues, I know I'm hearing the, the truth. We have only a few minutes left, but I, I really want to also talk about the cultural dimensions. Where does that come into play with this? Yeah, so let me let me give a, just a short example here, Michael. When we were interviewing um, different vendors to work with us, um, at the interview, uh, our vendors were asked to give a price um, with just based on the RFP. And when Avanad was asked about their price, um, and, and not providing one, you know, why didn't you provide a price? They said, because we won't create a false expectation for you, HNTB. Any price we give you is going to be wrong. And once that price is set, that's always going to be in your mind. And if it's anything different and more problematic, higher, <laughs> you're going to be a dissatisfied customer. And that really rung true with me, Michael, from a cultural perspective. HNTB doesn't do that either. We're not going to set a price out there to try to get a job and then have to adjust it or change it based on what we learn after the fact. We always look to discover and then deliver on what we we find with that discovery. And that really separated Avanad in my mind from every other vendor we talked to. And it's actually why they got the job because they are so close and in, in, in similar in nature and culture to how HNTB operates. They're always trying to find out and discover what's important to HNTB what do we value and how can they drive on that? And that's the same culture and mindset that HNTB has. So it's a very synergistic relationship that has uh, uh, grown over the two to three years we've been working together here. So the cultural fit is really crucial to make all of this work as you were describing it before. It's very critical in my mind. Um, without that, I don't. I, I know we would not be where we are today with our program. And, and I'm convinced we would have not gotten through some of the challenges that we've had uh, in the past uh, or over the course of the program. But it's because our cultures are focused on the same outcome and, and driving for client success that we found a path forward when we've stumbled and, and had to deal with those things. Brian, we have just about a minute left. I mean, I, I used to study the relationship between outside firms and software vendors and enterprise buyers like yourself. So I could talk about these issues all day, but, uh, but we have just about a minute left. And share with us, if you would, your advice to CIOs. We have a lot of CIOs that are in the audience. Share with, with us your advice for CIOs in terms of how they can support the business in, in a deeper, more profound way. Yeah, I, I would first say, 
you know, don't be afraid of the business. I mean, engage with them. And, and many of your CIOs, I'm sure do. But in major transformation programs like this, I'm convinced business has to lead it. And in having business lead it, it's not part-time leadership. You need full-time leadership. And you need full-time experienced leadership. That business leader or business team has to know how your company operates, what's their processes. Um, they need to have access and they need to have trust of, of the executive leadership of your business. This can't be somebody that's coming in new. Your, your, your executive leadership has to have the confidence in this. And I would, I would push, I would strive, I would encourage to make sure you get capable business people in here so you can maximize the likelihood of success on your program. So capable business people on the IT team, that's the, the key. On a major ERP program, that's exactly what I would recommend companies do to, 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 again, maximize the opportunity for success. Okay, well, that's great advice. And this has been a very fast 45 minutes. I would like to thank Brian Swenson, who is the Chief Process Officer <laughs> at the large engineering services firm, HNTB. Michael, it was a pleasure. I appreciate the time to talk with you and your audience this afternoon. And another huge shout out and thank you to Avanad. They are the leaders in the profession, leaders in professional services in the Microsoft ecosystem. I have worked with the company for a long time and I'm so grateful that they are underwriting CXO Talk. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Take a look at CXOTalk.com. We have lots of great content there and we will see you back here next week. We'll be talking about data science next week. So come on back. Bye-bye.